Greetings everyone, Brett here with Hammerhead Model Making, back with another full build video. Today we're going to be looking at the original boxing of Accurate Miniatures A36. Now I've done a review on this kit recently, and uh, this is a kit that I have built many times in the past, in the early 2000s. I built all of the Accurate Miniatures series of P51s, and I really like these kits. And even though it is definitely showing its age, I still think it builds up into a rather nice kit. Um, and another part about this video is going to be a somewhat of a lesson learned on being impatient. And, and I'll explain a little bit more about that later on in the video. I did manage to get a hold of a Edward Photo Etch set for this kit, as well as some Ultracast Resin Exhaust. And so I set about um, doing the cockpit here. Uh, I have removed the molded on um, rudder pedals so that I can replace those eventually with Photo Etch. And here I'm rummaging through my spare Photo Etch for some parts that I can use to detail up the radio faces. It's always good to keep old Photo Etch because you just never know when it might come in handy and when you can use old parts to help uh, whatever current kit you're working on. As you can see here, the radio faces are rather bland. There's just nothing there. It's just a flat surface. And so I'm using some spare photo etch just to kind of busy it up a little bit and give it the impression that it has detail. So while not completely accurate, it will look the part and it will look better than it was, than it did before with just, just blank plastic here. And uh, so I believe this photo etch actually came off of the F-105 I did recently. And there was fortunately enough of these parts that I could detail up all five radio uh, faces. Here are the Edward uh, rudder pedals. And so that's just pretty simple. You fold the sides up and then you can glue it to the back of the instrument face. So if you're curious why the instrument panel is clear, Accurate Miniatures tried to do this thing where using the clear instrument panel, you would actually put the decal for the instrument panel behind it, and then you would carefully paint the instrument panel face, uh, obviously avoiding the actual instrument faces themselves, and then the, the decal would show through. In execution, that never really worked all that well. Uh, I always just found it easier just to put the decal on front and hit it with a lot of uh, decal softener. The, uh, the biggest improvement for the Edward set is the seat. Uh, this, this photo etch seat is extremely nice, very, very convincing in scale and looks really good compared to the kit part, which was rather bulky and, and thick and just didn't look very good. Here I am using an old airbrush needle in a pin vise to create some pilot holes so that I can drill holes to insert some wire to further detail up the radio faces. I find it easier to punch in that little pilot hole with the um, airbrush needle first. And it just it just helps me in the drilling, especially when you're using a small drill bit in a, on a small area. It's easy for it to slip and poke yourself or do damage to the part. So I just find that easier. And here I'm just using some lead wire. This is 0 0.02 lead wire to represent the, the actual wires coming out of the radios. This is a little bit out of scale, a little, a little chunky, but uh, I prefer the I, I prefer going a slightly over scale than under scale. Just sometimes I find that if you if you're doing it you know close to as, as much in scale as possible or, or under scale, sometimes it just gets lost in my opinion, and it's hard to see that detail. Whereas if you kind of, you, you make it a little over scale, although not technically realistic, it, it is more visible and easier to see your work. So here I'm just kind of working a lot, working the, that wire along the side of, of the, uh, the sidewall detail there. Again, not strictly terribly accurate, but I think it gives a good, uh, impression of, of a busy cockpit. Um, it's interesting that the, the A36, well, that and the P51As, the early Mustangs, had these these radio stacks in the back. And I know that on P51Ds, for example, they had kind of the the, the battery and the radio on back above the the uh, fuselage tank. But this is just this is just interesting. So there's another little piece of photo etch that goes up on the inside uh, that 
connects to the antennas, the, re, the you know the receivers above the, the fuselage there. So I wanted to add a little bit of extra detail to this as well, make it look like the wires coming down from the antennas into the fuselage and then down into the radio stack. So that's what I'm doing here. And I, I did I was able to find some decent period drawings of this area, so uh, I know that those were actually connected. So here I'm just getting ready everything ready for painting. The uh, my my favorite here go to is the poster tad poster putty or blue tack, and uh, for sticking pieces to either popsicle sticks or you know little stir sticks or whatever whatever you might have laying around. So because of the different nose variants on the early P fifty one A A thirty six, it is a separate part here, and the instructions would have you join the fuselage halves first, then join the nose parts first, and then connect them all together. I always find that to be uh, problematic. Uh, I would rather have uh, a step or a seam line on the upper seam than I would along the side of the fuselage. So that's why I attached that part then instead of following the instructions. Uh, this part here is the gun sight. And the photo etch set comes with some pieces that really help uh, make it look much better than it did out of the box. Out of the box, it was just, it was kind of weird and, and it didn't really make sense. Uh, so I removed the, the actual reflector piece of glass on there, added the photo etch, and then we'll, uh, we'll add some clear parts later on. So getting ready to paint the interior, I am using the Vallejo primer because I know that I will not be doing necessarily doing any hard masking on this that would cause it to pull up. And it's, much quicker and easier to get this set up than to do uh, some of my um, lacquer-based primers. So everything just gets a nice coat here and get, make sure we have good coverage. And then I'm gonna go in and paint some of this stuff with some Alclad aluminum airframe color. Uh, I want to do some chipping. Uh, so the A36 is operated in the North Africa campaign, Italy, and they really, really got beat up and and abused. So what I what my goal was for this build was to really represent one of these very beat up, very used aircraft. And so I wanted to have a lot of chipping on the interior, and so using the outclad as the base just really provides a nice shiny uh, finish underneath. Here I'm using a sponge to apply some liquid mask. So this is going to this is going to represent the actual chipping. This will cover up certain areas of the metallic color. And then I can go through the whole painting process. And once it's done, I can remove the liquid mask and expose all that beautiful shiny aluminum. So just kind of going around adding where it makes sense, mainly concentrating on the seat and the cockpit floor. Now I can go through and do a little bit of pre-shading with uh, in the cockpit. So I'm using uh, Vallejo primer white. And I'm just kind of adding this in in random areas where I, I think it would make sense kind of using it to help highlight some areas. And I'm not not terribly concerned with, you know, keeping it all nice and tidy. Because largely once I get into painting the interior color, I, I want to try and cover up most of this just have a little bit of it shining through uh, showing through sorry. So here we can do our interior color. I am using the MIG color. This is my favorite interior green color. I've basically been, since I discovered this color, I've been using it pretty much on all of my World War II projects or, or any projects that need this color. I just think it's the best hue and tone. I like the yellow and the green combinations in it. And I just, for me, it works the best. And I know that this is really personal preference. Everybody has their favorites and the things that they like the most. This just happens to be, to be one of mine. And uh, I really, think it's the the best looking moving on we can start doing some hand painting in the cockpit uh, so i'm just using the uh just using vallejo's model range black so this is formulated for brush painting and i find that it works best if you thin it with just a little bit of tap water and it goes on nice and smooth without any issues there are a number of components within the cockpit that need to be hand painted and this is just the quickest way to do it for me. I know some people would take the time to, to mask off a lot of these little small pieces and, and then airbrush it. I just don't think the effort's worth it. 
especially with stuff that's either going to be difficult to see or almost impossible to see. The clear parts on this kit are really thick. And if you can manage to find a vacuform canopy for it, I know they used to make them back in the day. Absolutely go ahead and get it if you plan on making this because that'll be a huge improvement. The kit part is, it, it's passable, but it's just, it's really thick. And there's a lot of framing on it. So a lot of the cockpit will eventually be hidden and not very visible. So just keep that in mind. But it's still worth at least picking out the details. If not, you can take some great pictures of it before you close it all up. Here, uh, once now that we've got the painting done, we can go in and start removing the liquid mask that we applied earlier, uh, thus exposing the metallic layer underneath and, and giving us the effect of our chipped paint. And I really like how this is turning out. I really like how it's looking. Very pleased with it. We can also paint up uh, some of the wires and cabling within the cockpit that we added. This I'm just doing with a kind of a light neutral gray color. And I know there was often different colored wires in World War II cockpits. I just find gray is a good one generally overall to help represent that. And here I'm uh, putting in the hammerhead decal. Yeah, it will be hidden, but I like to know that it's there. And now we're applying the decal for the instrument panel. Again, like I said, uh, accurate miniatures, miniatures originally intended for this to be done on the backside and then shine through. And in concept, it's kind of a neat and novel idea, but in practice, it just doesn't always, didn't ever work right. It's unfortunate that they give you, so they give you the decal for the main instrument cluster, but not any of the bottom stuff. So just keep in mind, you will need to hand paint that. Here, I'm just adding some solid set to get that to settle down in there. And once everything is done and ready, we can give it all a gloss coat. Gloss coat. Uh, you will notice I'm not using my normal Alclad gloss coat here, and that's gonna play a big part later on. This, I'm just using the last little bit of my mech finish, and it's all right, it's it's working. Um, it's, it's formulated pretty similarly to the Alclad Aqua Gloss. Uh, this is just a little thick. You can see it's kind of going on kind of like with an orange peel effect. It will self-level a little bit, but in the end, it worked. So now we can do our wash, and I'm using my customary dark brown wash for green vehicles, and this just goes on as normal. Um, essentially applying it as a pin wash to all the details in the cockpit. This will also help add another layer of weathering as well as kind of deepen a lot of the details and, and, and make certain details pop. So I'm just applying it liberally all, all over uh, all over the, the cockpit, all the details in the cockpit, pretty much everything in the cockpit will get a wash from this. I think the only thing I didn't wash was the actual instrument panel face because it's black and this wash won't show up on, on against black. But everything else gets, gets a good healthy coverage. And then the process is usually wait about 30 minutes. That's usually about how long it takes for everything to dry. If it was applied a little heavier, it may take a little bit longer for it to dry, but 30 minutes is usually right, right around that, that sweet spot. And then we can just take our cotton bud and remove all the excess. So this will just, this will leave the wash in the recesses and the crevices, kind of creating a little bit more of a shadow, you know, or, or deep in those, those crevices. Uh, but it's removed off of all the higher flat surfaces and really pleased with it working out good and that 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 brown color is just perfect for these types of interiors here I am I again I, I dug down into the photo etch spares and applying some placards from the spares uh, that approximate what would have been in the Mustang I mean it's not exact but I think it gets the point across, and I believe these all came from uh, Edward photo etch set for the Tamiya P50 or P47, and uh, I ended up with extras because I didn't apply everything. So here we go. It, it just really helps kind of spruce up the cockpit and 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 add a lot, a little bit of variety in there in color. So uh, also a few more, a few of the photo etch pieces on the instrument panel itself, and we're good to go. So now we can seal everything in with a matte coat. This will help obviously reduce the shine and uh, just overall make the cockpit ready for the next stages of the build. But really happy. I think the uh, the cockpit was really fun to do and it really turned out really turned out good. So now we can start getting everything all 
uh, assembled, get the fuselage all put together. And uh, here's the, the gun sight that I'd mentioned earlier. Just got a little piece of, of uh, clear acetate on there and uh, much better than the original kit part there. And now we can start getting the cockpit assembled. Really pleased with the overall look here. The the additional things like the photo etch and the, the cabling and stuff really didn't uh, take much more effort, but I think just really kind of helps boost the, the the quality of the cockpit. And like I mentioned before, it's, it's already actually pretty good out of the box. Um, I mean, all, all I really did was just add details. I didn't fundamentally change anything other than the actual seat. So out of the box is not bad. The, the seat is probably the weakest point of the cockpit. So if you can get a hold of the, the, the photo etch set for it, I highly recommend it. But definitely not, you know, not one of those things where like you have to have it or else. So a few more parts to go into the cockpit here now that we've got out the fuselage halves glued together. Uh, so this little bracing part in here and then the... Uh, the pilot seat rests up. So the, the seat slots into two holes on the floor and then rests against that that brace that we just put in. So looks really good. I'm really happy with it. And the uh, I, I think it's it's pretty good looking. And I think it conveys, you know, that well-worn, used, used look. So now we're going to concentrate on the uh, shroud over the instrument panel and the gun sight before we close up all the, the clear parts in here. And uh, so this just... Uh, I, I did have to do a little bit of sanding on the on the shroud in order to kind of blend it together, but then we just hit it with a little some black, a light gray dry brush, and then this leather color for the trim, and that will kind of complete that off, and we can install the gun sight. So the gun sight just slots in. I, I did have to trim the opening a little bit to make it fit properly, but once once I got that, then it was then it kind of goes in nice and easy. And uh, now we can start working on the seams of the kit. So I'm starting off with a rather aggressive file. So this is a jeweler's file. And there was a decent step. And I find that it's just, I, I can get a lot of work done quickly using this aggressive file. I mean, it, this, does this does take off a lot of material. And then I can slowly progress to finer and finer grit sand, sanding sticks and sandpaper to, to really get that seam to disappear. Uh, there are a few trouble spots on here, namely there's this this little rectangular opening modeled on the, the the intake there, and that's not present on the A36, so that has to be filled in. So I'm using some Timia putty there. It took a couple of applications to really get that to fill in, and there was a couple other places that I needed some putty as well. Uh, the overall fit was, it was marginal at best. Uh, I, I, I ended up using more putty than I expected to with this kit, but in the end, I got it to where I needed to get it. So here we're just restoring some panel lines and lost detail using my little micro saw. And uh, with all the sanding done, we can get the clear parts installed. Now the clear parts actually fit really well, especially these 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 back panel, these back windows here. There's, there's no real like, they don't rest on anything other than the, that inside edge. And yet they still fit in there really, really good. The, the actual windscreen, the front windscreen, I had to trim just a little bit to get it to seat properly. But once I got that done, then it just locks right in and it all looks really good. Here I'm using a masking set from Edward and this I got second hand uh, because it's it's an out of production set. And it fit, for the most part, it fit really nice. There were a few areas where I had to trim the mask just like, I mean, we're talking like half a millimeter trimming to get it to fit correctly and but it, it it works out in the end and very helpful especially because the the actual framing on these clear parts is really soft and shallow so if i was trying to if you're trying to mask that by hand it would be tough here's probably my biggest complaint about the kit is the propeller shape and thickness is completely just out of whack it just it just looks terrible and so I decided I would chop off the kit propellers and replace them with some donor propellers off of an Edward P400 kit. Uh, the P400 kit actually comes with three different st styles of propeller blades because they had they just had different options in the kit. And I chose I chose the one that looked best for the A36 that I also I knew I wasn't going to be using that option in the P400 kit. 
So um, drill holes in the hub here, uh, attach some pins that are, this is so this is floral, floral wire and drill holes in the corresponding propeller blade. And then we can get those all attached on there. Rather simple and straightforward modification and much, much better looking in terms of the thickness and the profile of these propeller blades. So we can continue on and, and keep working on the rest of the construction. Here we got the, the uh, horizontal stabilizers going in and working on details in the wing. So on the early Mustangs, the landing light was actually in fared into the leading edge of the wing. And the accurate miniature kits really provide no detail there. It's just an opening into the wing. And so I decided I wanted to scratch build a little bit of detail in there to actually represent the landing lights, as well as I had to cut out the molded in dive brakes and put a black backing sheet there. So here, these are the actual rudder pedals that I cut off of the instrument panel earlier on in the video. And they had those little ejector nubs on there, which were just about the perfect size for the landing lights. And so I used those and hit them with that, with the uh, Molotow Chrome marker and use those as my landing lights. So it actually just worked out really nicely that, that those were there and I happened to keep those parts instead of throwing them away after I clipped them off. So again, remember, hang on to things. You, you, you never know when they might come, become useful. So much, much better looking than just a gaping empty hole and uh, much better detail. So here we can get the wing house put together now and you can see that, that white plastic showing through where the dive brakes were one of the reasons why I wanted to purchase the Edward photo etch set was specifically so I could get the dive brakes so that I could have them open. It just looks cool with the dive brakes open, even though it's not necessarily something that would have been, you know, realistic in a wartime condition for it to have those open on the ground doing nothing. But that's the great thing about scale modeling is we can do whatever we want with our kits. Um, here we can get the wings attached to the fuselage. This fit was fairly good and really didn't have to fiddle around with it too much. Pretty much the only seam I had to fill was just right at the very front there, that that wing that wing joint. And here my uh, my black cat overlord is questioning why I would cover up her favorite water dish, which also happens to be my my brush cleaning uh, water. Go figure. So moving on, we can start assembling the dive brakes. So these are multiple parts and. Again, this this was the reason why I got the Edward set was because I really wanted to show these as deployed. I just think it looks cool. So we have to do a little bit of bending and then glue on the outer panel here. So we're just carefully doing that and then using super glue to glue on the outer panel. This was kind of a kind of tricky just because the parts were so small and the contact points were so small and I wanted to make sure I could get it lined up correctly. But luckily I was using some super glue that has a little bit of working time. So I had a little bit of time to adjust it. And here we go. So we've got top and bottom brakes. So now we can start moving on to the painting. And this is where things kind of start going off the rails, as it were. So here I'm just hitting the interior framing of the canopy with the interior green before I move on to the rest of the painting, just because a little bit of it will show through and I just want to make sure that it's the correct color. And to prime the whole thing, I'm going to be using All Clads Gloss Black. And I wanted to do this because I want, again, like I said, this is gonna be a very well-worn used aircraft and I wanted a lot of paint chipping and a lot of that aluminum color to be showing through the paint. So I wanted to give it a nice, good, shiny black finish and then hit it with the aluminum all clad. So now we can just get this applied on. I apologize, I didn't take actual any footage of the gloss black going on, but I think you get the idea. And uh, just make sure you get nice, good, good, uh, good layers of the metallic on and and it, it's funny after doing this i got to thinking like man an all metal p51a would look pretty cool um so here again we're using liquid mask to create our paint chippings so concentrating them and again so i i was doing this off of reference pictures and there was there was a very specific aircraft that i wanted to represent that it was just super dirty chipped to no end and just filthy and so that's really what i was going for so i so I was I was following a lot of reference images on on where these things would chip and where a lot of a lot of that wing root area, and around the gun bays, around the the fuel fillers on the top of the wing, and a lot of the engine area was was heavily chipped, 
And now we can apply our olive drab. So for this, I'm using the olive drab base by MIG. Uh, this is a good dark olive drab color. It, on its own, it's great. But when you pair it with the olive drab highlight color, you can really create some, some good subtle um, shading and, and lightening of the of the original base color. So I'm just going to go through and hit a lot of these panels with the, the lightened version, the highlight color, just to create some color modulation and really trying to concentrate on the all of the upper surfaces for the most part and then kind of coming down to the side. Uh, next up we can move on to the underside color. So we're just using this gray color here from MIG and I had contemplated whether I wanted to you know, use like the, the blue tack poster putty stuff to, to create the demarcation and ultimately just decided I was going to do it by hand. And I'm glad I did because looking at reference pictures, it, it really was a soft edge camouflage scheme. And I just think it much, much more realistic looking. And uh, so just make sure, you know, a little bit more careful along the demarcation, but we can, we can open up the airbrush a little bit once, once we get to the larger areas. Next up, we're going to do the theater markings. So uh, this was stationed in Italy, North Africa. So we had the yellow bands on the wings. Um, I masked it off and then painted it white first and then yellow. It just helps the yellow be much more vibrant than if I were painting it over the olive drab. And here we go. So we can start removing the liquid mask to expose our chipping. And you can see my the masking tape from painting the theater bands pulled a little bit off of the... Um, the, the gun bay is there, but with, with our little rubber thing here, we can remove the bulk of it and really expose a lot of that beautiful aluminum color underneath and really, really happy with how this was turning out. It was just kind of the right, uh, you know, combination of, of size and quantity and var variety on the chipping. So now we can also paint up the wheel well. This is with a zinc chromate yellow by MIG. And again, this is MIG is making quickly becoming one of my favorite paint manufacturers just because I really like their colors. Uh, here is the mostly completed spinner. So I, this got the whole same treatment as everything else. And uh, pretty soon we're gonna you're gonna start seeing some problems here. So at this point, I was super happy with the build. I was happy with the paint job. Everything was going great. And that's when everything started going bad. So like I had mentioned before, I had run out of my Alclad Aqua Gloss. And it was going to be another two weeks before my hobby shop could order new ones or get new, new, uh, new bottles in. So I compromised and I bought a can of Tamiya Gloss spray paint. And I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll just use that and it'll work just fine. So I glossed the whole, th whole thing with the Tamiya can and... Uh, and then in addition to that, the kit decals, you know, were nearly 40 years old and they were, they were unusable. They just shattered. So I ended up purchasing another set of decals specifically for the airplane that I wanted to do from a company called Draw Decals. <clears throat> now I had issues with these decals, but to be fair to Draw Decal, they do have a little disclaimer blurb in their instructions about their decals. And had I actually taken the time to read those, probably could have avoided some of these issues but these decals are quite thick very thick I, I would say thicker than Tamiya decals and on top of that they are not affected by setting solutions uh, including the solva set that I use which tends to be pretty pretty strong and so I, I mean I was I was bummed by this I was annoyed by this but it was like they were really my only option to model the specific aircraft that I wanted to do so I pressed forward um, but one of the, so one of the drawbacks to using the Tamiya gloss from the spray can was that it actually had a weird reaction with the exposed Alclad paint. And I don't know, you, you can kind of tell in this image here in this part of the video here where you can see some of where the, the, the Alclad was showing through as, as the chipping. The Tamiya gloss like attacked it and caused it to go really dark and grainy. And it, I was just, you know, I was just, I had been getting impatient. I had been, I was really excited with how the build was going up to until this. And so I was just, I really wanted to get it done. And, and so it was just kind of like, uh, all right, well, I can, I can live with it. I can deal with it. It wasn't that bad. The decals, I could live with them. 
they weren't it, not my favorite but you know i could i could live with it uh to to at least complete the project and at this point so i've i've completed the decals did my best to get them to conform hit everything with another layer of the Tamiya gloss the spray can gloss and was going to move on to my normal process which is doing a panel line with with the panel wash that i've pretty much used for the last like 20 builds that i've done and so here here i am applying it in my normal manner getting into all the all the engraved recesses and when i came to start wiping it away wouldn't come off and it, like it, i mean it was stuck on there good and so i was like okay well maybe it just needs a little help so i put a little bit of thinner on my paper towel and at first that kind of started to work and it's it started coming off and i mean it's, it still had to work for it but i could see that i was removing it and and that's when the trouble really got started so the the combination of the of the wash and the thinner started stripping everything down to bare plastic and and this is the actual moment right there <laughs> where i realized that i was stripping this down to bare plastic and um here's some pictures of what it looked like afterwards so needless to say i was just i was gutted you know it was it was the gloss it was the decals and now this and i was bummed so i decided that i was going to strip the whole thing and start over uh just using some oven cleaner here and you you spray this on you let it soak for like an hour or two and then you can come and and start scrubbing it uh, i recommend doing this in a well ventilated area this stuff is pretty nasty but it, it does work eventually uh you can see here that i really had to scrub to get those decals off uh you know props to them that those decals were really hard to remove but i did get through it eventually and stripped it all the way back down to bare plastic but I did, once I did that, I put it on the shelf. I, I was super frustrated, super disappointed. So I, I set it on the shelf and was like, okay, I'm going to work on something else and then come back to it later. And now I'm not going to bore you with the whole painting process all over again. Suffice it to say, by this point, I had gotten all the proper uh, clear coats that I wanted and decided that I was going to just create my own fictional airplane using decals that i had spare decals that i had and that way i knew i'd be using decals that i'm familiar with and using material and product that i'm familiar with and i would do it correctly this time and and i'd given myself enough time to to kind of you know get over my my frustration so here we go so here is the repainted version and and at this point so i'm basically picking up picking up where I had messed up previously so i've already done the wash everything's good and i'm happy with how it's looking it's 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 a fictional aircraft so it gets to be whatever i want it to be and i've hit it with a matte coat so that i can start working on the weathering because again i was i was really wanting to do this really beat up well weathered aircraft and i knew i'd be doing a lot of oil paints here so a few things that i wanted to do just real quickly before i hit the oil paints was to get the landing gear on so i could at least have it uh, you know, standing on something other than just the, the fuselage. And it, and so while I was doing that, I hit it with a quick, uh, quick oil wash just to pick out some of the details, but I will eventually do the more weathering later on. So moving into the weathering. And if you, if you've seen my super stallion video, I use a lot of the same processes that I, on that build that I use on this one. And so really what I wanted to concentrate on was fading. The, the, the reference images that I have of these aircraft, they got really faded in that Italian sun, North Africa sun. And so I was, I was really wanting to represent the fading and, and then just kind of the dirt buildup that these things would get as well. Often operating in dirty, sometimes muddy airfields. And so essentially what I'm doing here is I'm covering a complete area or a small section in mineral spirits and then applying my oil paint to the the wetened surface and then i come back in with a large brush that is also dampened with mineral spirits to start blending everything in and the overall process 
took multiple layers because I wanted different, there's different areas where I wanted the fading to be more intense, areas where I wanted it to be a little bit more subtle. So it took multiple passes and layers to build up the the intensities that I wanted to, but essentially the process is just the same, just repeated over and over again. So I start out with the the lighting lighter colors. So here I'm basically blending or mixing some browns and whites together to kind of get like a really light tan color, kind of almost a buff color, and blending that in, working that over all of the horizontal surfaces. So that's the wings, the the top of the fuselage, the the horizontal stabilizers, and then kind of blending it down uh, depending on on the needs. I, I did notice that the the fading tended to be uh, more heavily concentrated uh, on the wing roots as well as the the nose area. So that's where I really concentrated most of my weathering efforts. But it, there is some a little bit throughout the the aircraft. Next up. I started doing my darker colors. So this is going to be representing more of like the dirt, the grime, grease, oil, those kinds of things that would build up on the aircraft. And these I'm trying to concentrate more along the panel lines as opposed to the, the lighter color, which was more along kind of the interior of the panels. And and so again, we're just, we, we flood the area with the mineral spirit and then we apply the oil paint and then blend it in. And I, I'm, I've really begun to like this process it's it's pretty fast. I, I like the results it gives, but it also gives me a lot of control, and I feel like I can man, manipulate the paint as I as I need. So it just again, it's just working my way through the process, removing it as I need to, adding as I need to. The nice thing about this process is, if I feel like I've added it in the wrong place or maybe too strong, I really can just come in with a with a large wide brush that's that's dipped in the in the white spirits, and and remove pretty much everything that I put on. Um, but I I do I do I will wait about 12 hours in between coats, and that's usually enough that the whatever coat I'm currently doing doesn't really mess with the coat below it, and uh, so I can so I can build these these layers and and create this multi layer weathering process, but quite pleased with the results for the exhaust staining again th some of the reference pictures I had was th it was really heavy exhaust staining and I, I imagine that the ground crew didn't didn't really get the opportunity to wash these vehicles very often and, and remove a lot of this buildup and and so the the exhaust staining really went from from the ex engine exhaust all the way back past the wing roots to the to the lower aft fuselage there so here I'm just I, I'm I'm applying the the staining in somewhat of a dry brushing type technique really blending it in working it not using a lot of thinner i wanted to have it really concentrated and then i can use thinners to kind of feather the edges a little bit and blend those in where i need to but i, I i'm happy with with the the effect that this gives and the intensity of it so working on over my onto the bottom uh for this i really wanted to concentrate on oil stains and kind of dirt and mud kick up from, from the muddy fields that they'd be operating in. So here what I'm really doing is just concentrating on those oil stains, just adding little dots of, of black oil paint, and then using a loaded up brush with mineral spirits and, and dragging that back and, and creating that streaking effect. And, and the brush that I'm using is kind of an older brush, so it's kind of frayed, so it allows me to kind of create these, you know, these broken lines pulling back. And so some don't, you know, sometimes don't throw out your old brushes. They, they might come in handy for weathering. And uh, just making sure I got the matching stain here on the landing gear door. So with the weathering largely done, we can move on to kind of putting together the rest of the kit, all the smaller pieces here. So one of the nice things about the Accurate Miniatures kit is they do have separate hubs for their wheels and their wheels have molded in flat spots. So and, and that's 30 or 40 years ago. So props to them for that. That's always a good thing because not even modern manufacturers can still get that right. Uh, we can start removing the masking. Uh, for the second go around, I ended up using some Montex masks and I, I used them because they were available, but they were definitely not the best. The, I did have to trim them around a little bit to get them to fit properly. Uh, additionally, I'm doing the uh, all the navigation lights and the formation lights here. So I'm using the Molotow uh, chrome pen to do the base for these and 
they're kind of tricky just because of the way I think of this pen as like a kind of an uber ballpoint pen. So you just got to be kind of tricky on, on how you get all that paint out. And then once that dries, then we go over the chrome parts with clear paint. So we're using some clear red here to do part of the formation light and the navigation lights. And then we follow that up with the uh, with green for the other for the for the second formation light as well as the other wing navigation lights and then finally we will have a yellow color for the third and final formation light uh, in these shots you can also see the weathering that i did on the bottom side of the aircraft for the for the mud and dirt and kicked up so that was really just a lot of flicking the brush loaded with thinned oil paint to get that effect uh, adding in the ultra cast resin exhaust these were very nice and here we're just doing a little bit of mud and dirt on the wheels to match the base that will eventually be going on same thing with the landing gear door here just to match help it match up with the the colors that are used on the base that this will be going on so this is just a little bit of stippling so this is actually acrylic paint just kind of stippling it on then we can get these attached the uh the attachment points are pretty good i mean it's it's really kind of hard to mess up you got to make sure you get the right angle so i i use some slow setting glue here so that i could position the actuators on and make sure everything was all aligned and uh, get that all squared away so that it looked correct and just make sure you do both sides then we can do the outer doors uh, these just slot into the both the wing and then have attachment points to the landing it themselves. I did buy a set of uh, resin gun barrels for this since the supplied barrels were really just kind of basic tubes and didn't look very good. And I wanted that since it has these machine guns that stick out of the lower cowl, they're pretty prominent. I wanted to have something decent. I had considered getting some master barrel ones, but I wanted to try these out. And uh, I think they turned out pretty good. I, I'm happy with them. We can get the ordnance attached now. Uh, since this was a dive bomber, it's suitable to have some bombs attached to it and get these all on so they look pretty good. And then the final touch here is we can finally add the dive brakes. So this really just kind of completes it. And I am very pleased with how this eventually turned out in spite of all of the hiccups. So here is the final reveal and I am quite happy with how this project turned out. Like I mentioned, I think the biggest lesson that I learned from this is that there really is no place in scale modeling for being rushed and for, uh, you know, really kind of half-assing it as it were. The, uh, I, I ran into this problem where I wanted to get it done. I wanted to hurry and, and cause I was having so much fun and I went out of my normal comfort zone with products that I wasn't familiar with, and it kind of came back to bite me. So once I was able to take some time off from it, get the proper stuff that I needed for it, it turned out much better. So let this be a lesson to you. Don't do what I do. <laughs> um, you know, have patience with your products, with your projects, and make sure you have the stuff that you're familiar with. And if you're you if you are using something new, which is because you should. You know, we should all be trying new stuff, new products, new techniques. You know, test it on something non-critical instead of a project that you're invested in. But in the end, it did work out. I, I, I did learn some stuff. I learned my lesson, and well, at least I hope I did. And I will be more diligent going in, going on in the future with projects to just be really be like, okay, do I have what I need? And not rush myself and not force myself into stuff that I'm not familiar with. Anyways, um, if you've made it this far, I appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Uh, this was a fun project overall, and I'm pleased with the results. Uh, if you're not a subscriber, I would suggest you subscribe. And uh, I try to post often both builds and reviews. And I have a lot of really interesting builds coming up. Um, if you want to support the channel, hit the like button, hit the like button and, uh, consider joining my Patreon. So shout out to my Patreons here and thank you for watching. Bye.